Welcome to a radical discussion of independence, free will, liberty, and the left hand path. This is Damon Ossoff, your host, Paul Frederick. Welcome back to Damon Osophy. Today, I got a guest named Patrick Dugan, also known as Biker Witch, an artist, tattooer, entrepreneur, left hand path black magic practitioner, owner of Vamachara Tattoo Studio and Occult Supply Shop in Long Island, New York. He holds a Bachelor's of Fine Arts in Illustration from the New York City School of Visual Arts. He does Badass tattoos. That's how I started talking to him. And he also uh, has a really cool uh, vlog going on YouTube where he talks about all kinds of really great uh, vlog and occult and, and things that I uh, that are near and dear to my heart. So, hey, Patrick, welcome to the show. How's it going, Paul? Thanks for having me. Good. It's good to see you, man. So, um, how did you find the left-hand path? Um, honestly, uh, I think... So when I was growing up, uh, I, I think um, my, my grandmother largely raised me and she did some stuff that was kind of uh, she was actually born and raised in Poland, from what I understand. And uh, she did some stuff that was kind of uh, folk magic ish and maybe kind of bordered on Enochian sort of stuff. She was very obsessed with uh, doing spells and stuff for um, different archangels and that sort of stuff. And uh, I think when I was young, I thought my grandma was just kind of quirky. Um, her best friend used to come over and read tarot cards for like my whole family and stuff. Uh, so I was exposed to that sort of thing like really early on. But I think as I got older, I found most people's kind of spiritual lives to be pretty lackluster. You know, uh, everybody seemed to um, just by default be like, oh, yeah, I'm Christian because, you know, uh, that's kind of the societal norm. But I always thought um, that your spiritual path should be something a little bit more uh, uh, integral and something that's a little bit more fulfilling. And it just didn't seem like that was the way that people experience their spiritual lives. Um, and then I, I grew up in my teen years in the, the hardcore kind of punk scene and stuff. And I got exposed to a lot of like Hare Krishnas and was into bands like 108 and uh, the Crow Mags and that sort of stuff. So um, I remember kind of looking into Hinduism and that sort of stuff. And I think the mythology really spoke to me a lot, but um, you know, Prabhupada and like, you know, the Iskon temple and that sort of stuff seemed a little too, I couldn't put my finger on it at the time, but I think it was the kind of right hand path approach to Hinduism that didn't really speak to me. And uh, I, through that though, found um, uh, Zen Buddhism, which actually spoke to me a lot more. I think it uh, just seemed a little more natural to me. So I did that for a few years, kind of uh, did Zen meditation until um, I was actually in college and I uh, continued kind of reading up on um, Hindu mythology and then uh, I was in an Irish literature course, and uh, the professor was um, talking about William Butler Yeats, and uh, she mentioned Theosophy and Blavatsky and stuff. And I, because I, I mean, me being of Irish descent, I heard her talking about like, oh yeah, 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 the, uh, Theosophy. It was like a mixture of Irish paganism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and uh, it was this whole like Irish revival thing mixed with like ceremonial magic and whatnot. And up until that point, I mean, other than maybe, I think maybe in high school I had read LaVey, and that was basically the only Western uh, occult thing I had been exposed to. And I liked it, but I didn't really go any deeper than that. So once I heard that, I immediately perked up. I was probably sleeping and collapsed up until this point. I was like, wait, 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 go back to that. And I was like, what can you tell me more about that? And the professor was basically like, I don't really know anything about that sort of stuff. I'm like an Irish literature professor. I don't know much about this occult stuff. But I wrote down the names and I, and I ran to the library and got, you know, books by Blavatsky and stuff, which obviously led me to Crowley. I started researching like the Obad and Druidry and all sorts of stuff. It was really new to me. And I was just like excited to find things that were Western that kind of hit on a lot of the things I thought were only Eastern up until that point. And, mm -hmm. um, Pretty quickly, I kind of got into the Norse mythology sort of stuff, started kind of talking with people online that were maybe more in the Ossetru realms, that sort of stuff. And um, we're talking probably about 2010, uh, somewhere in that area. And um, 
I also got involved with a lot of like kind of mostly atheistic because again I didn't know that there was other things out there satanic forums and whatnot and started reading up in that realm until I found the things that were more of a theistic and occult bent uh but yeah so I kind of got involved with both of those things and at first it seemed like very diametrically opposed until of course I found Edward Thorson's uh, Stephen Flowers and kind of realized there was a connection there Mm-hmm. And uh, I wasn't just completely, you know, barking up two separate trees. Uh, but yeah, um, I think that that was kind of where I and I and I continued to kind of go down both those paths until um, finding a, a lot of common ground between these things over the years. Yeah, you mentioned flowers. So um, uh, were you thinking uh, Lords of the Left Hand Path? Yeah, that was probably the first one. But again, I was into the Nordic stuff. So I remember reading a lot of his, like, like I believe Futhark was probably one of the first ones I read. Yeah. And then um, I got, uh, what was his book on the Rune Guild? Um, uh, it's the one with, like, the rituals about burying the sword and whatnot and those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, Nine Doors of Midgard? Nine Doors of Midgard, yeah. Yeah. That one was slipping my tongue. But, yeah, I read that one. Yeah. Um, I got his book on like uh, kind of the Icelandic magic book and, you know, all those sorts of things. And I pretty quickly got really into collecting whatever the hell I could get my hands on from him. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm with you on all that. And I think his uh, Lords of the Left Hand Path is just so uh, it's a seminal work as far as defining the left hand path. Right. I mean, you know, a lot of people use this term left hand path and they just use it as synonymous with, you know, occultism and, you know, dark, dark, dark aesthetic uh, type yeah. stuff. But he really goes in and he really specifically defines, you know, there's these specific values associated with it, you know, individuality, initiation, you know, um, all of that, all of that kind of stuff. And, and the way he goes and I mean, like like all the things that you were just talking about, you know, theosophy, Buddhism, um, you know, uh, Levian Satanism. Why is it that 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 I can find something significant in all of these things? And 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 it's because there's that kernel in all of them. Uh, there's there's that, that kernel that is, you know, the, the core of the left hand path or this idea of the black flame, you know, is like almost at the start with with every every system because it's kind of at the start it's at the basis of why a human being starts saying you know who am i why what is the meaning of my existence on this planet what can i do you know what am i supposed to do and all these all these sorts of things so it's very interesting because like you're saying you could find this kernel of that that left hand path in just about all of these paths but you can also find the direction where things go in the obvious much broader right hand path in each one of these sorts of things as well yeah so there's there's that which I guess goes back to that Setian idea that basically like it doesn't matter what paradigm you find yourself in, you know, sort of like you're you're gonna gravitate towards that adversarial current no matter what culture or what religion you're coming up in. There's that that seed that that basically exists that that poisonous chaotic element that's always going to exist at, at the underbelly of right. every system that comes up. Yeah, no, that's a great that's a great observation. And you mentioned like a, and, and from a Setian perspective, so that Setian, uh, like the pattern of of set, you know, uh, you know, cutting himself in the womb, you know, that's like kind of the essence of like the the the, the left hand path to to assert one's individuality, to assert one's uniqueness, you know, um, as a as a as a unique and isolated being. That's sort of the left hand path thing. Um, Within all of these, and I think, I, to me, a lot of the major religions, and I think this is a theme in 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 Lords of the Left Hand Path, is that well, what happens is then after, you know, this you know teacher, you know, uh, you know disseminates his teaching or whatever, and some people get into it. Well, eventually, what happens is other people get you know get involved and say, hey, we can use this system to control people, and then and then it turns into a religion. Right. That's why that's what takes it from being like a left hand path spiritual movement into being like an organized religion. And that's the difference. It's not so much the ideas. And there's something liberating about that. Once you realize that, well, that means um, then, well, we can go in and talk about we can talk about the significance of like, you know, teachings of of, of say, Jesus or something. And that doesn't mean that. And, and that's like really a separate thing from 
the church and like what the church is like trying to do, right? It's like the teaching is something that's different than the what the organization organizations end up doing with it. You know, you know yeah, what I mean? It, especially the kind of Gnostic gospels that were left out. But I mean, even in the mainstream Bible, the canonized sort of version, if you, if you just take the things that Jesus is apparently saying, I think there's a much more broad way to interpret what's what's being said rather than the kind of conclusions that the church comes to them for you. They mm -hmm. come to their own conclusions. And and I think for me, even reading like just about any mythology, I always feel like the adversarial um, characters are always begging you to come to your own conclusions. And, you know, uh, the institutions are telling you to kind of like lock those things out and not use your intuition and reason. You know, I always yeah. feel like uh, uh, many of these characters are kind of just like tempting you, like, you know, don't you see what's going on here? You know, like put it again, put together A and B, you know, I look at, um, for instance, I think it's the most clear in like the Norse. When you look at a character like Loki, you have that story right before Ragnarok where he's not allowed at this party where he's kind of been exiled and, and, and he's cast out from the rest of the gods and he shows up and everybody's bragging about how fucking great they are. And he comes into the room storming in and basically upsets everybody by pointing out, like, here's where you're flawed and you're not living up to your potential. Here's where you're flawed and you're not about what you say you're about. And here's what and he's constantly begging you to come to your own conclusions. You even look at, like, the instance where uh, Loki cuts off um, Sif, Thor's wife's hair. And uh, Thor is basically like, oh, my God, she's so disgusting. I can't even look at her, you know. And you're like, dude. It's, it's your wife's hair, man. Big fucking deal. You know, like, is that really the God you want to worship? You know, this guy that won't even look at his wife because she lost her hair. And, you know, I think that's exactly the point is basically like these adversarial characters put, you know, even the book of Job, you know, they, they put the infallible creator God, the demiurge character in this situation where you get to see their true character. Mm -hmm. And they're begging you like, dude, see this guy for what he is. Is he really worthy of worship? Right. And yet still the institutions say, well, ignore that, you know, like, I know this doesn't seem, but God works in mysterious ways. So right. you just lay down and take it. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, the, the quintessential left hand path act is that you must interpret, you must make your own meaning and 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 make your own, you know, um, interpretation of of whatever it is that we're talking about rather than accept a a prefabricated interpretation that's how the you know how the church presents everything this is what this story means this is what that story means and there's only you know these are the official that's the official interpretation and nope that's it you know um so yeah no you're you're, you're right on the money there I, i've always found it telling and interesting that the whole reason we have like a lot of these norse stories goes back to snorre who was a christian monk and he believed that these stories needed to be written down because he thought that the Christians of his day were losing the ability to read their own mythology poetically, which he thought was not an issue for the pagan peoples that came before. So he thought that this multi-layered sort of reading of the mythology or the religion was essential. Mm -hmm. And it seems like he wrote them down and now basically a bunch of Ossetruers get to have their lore preserved on some level, but I don't think Christians are any better, which was his intention at reading their own lore. Mm -hmm. No, I think you're right. So let me ask you this. How did you get, how did you get into tattooing then? So we're talking about your, uh, your, how you got into magic in the left-hand path. Where did, where did the tattooing piece come in on all of this? Honestly, man, I think like a lot of people, I was a pretty depressed teenager. Um, and, uh, most of the people in my family, uh, growing up were most of the women in my family woke up and went to work in kitchens and that sort of stuff and busted their asses. And most of the men in my family like drove 18 wheelers or tow trucks or something like that. And they were all pretty miserable people. And, uh, I used to hang out at my one buddy's house and his dad was a tattoo artist and he used to collect like medieval weapons. He always had cool books laying around. He listened to all the same music we did, you know, and he just seemed like a really cool guy. And he was like pushing 50, guy had been tattooing for like 30 years and he was one of the only adults I knew that seemed happy. So I was like, you know what, man, I want to be a tattooer. Like, fuck it, man. And I, you know, I think when I was like 16 years old, I was really debating on whether or not I really even wanted to do this whole like living thing. You know, I was like, man, if that's going to be my life, I just want to check out. 
but I saw him and it, and it gave me hope. Like, you know, like you can have a cool life and, you know, not dread every single day that you wake up. <laughs> so I was like, screw it. I'm going to go for being an artist. And I, I think a lot of people early on treated me like I was dumb and I couldn't do it. But, you know, I was like, well, I don't really see a point in living if I can't do something that I want to do. So I kind of just decided that I was going to basically do this or, or die in the process of trying to do it and kind of made a, a bit of a uh, pact with myself that if it didn't work out and I dug myself in too deep, I always had an exit. Wow. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And it, it's definitely worth it because your work is like uh, really, really fucking incredible. I'm just blown away with it. I follow you on Instagram and, and, and you, gotta, you, you know, I got to come out there and get some uh, get some ink from you sometime when, I'm they, actually when gonna they decide. Be, it, uh-huh. I'm going to be in Texas, actually, I think in uh, April, I believe, for a week April. or two. OK, well, let's get together. For yeah, sure. that would be cool. I've yeah. never actually been to Texas, but uh, I have a friend who's um, he does uh, some programming for me for like personal training wise and stuff. He's out in uh -huh. Texas. I don't know if you know Astrid Coyote. I don't think so. She's uh, she's kind of chaos magic sort of leaning person. She lives in the kind of Austin area. I'll probably go okay. and visit her. Okay. You know, um, she's done some stuff with like Orly Stewart and that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah, yes, I've heard, that. I've heard of that. Heard that name. So, are you going to be in Austin? I'm in Houston. Yeah, uh, I think me and uh, two of my friends are actually getting an RV. Um, my one friend, she's a, a professional dominatrix. Okay. So she's going to be on the road taking some clients, and I'll be taking some tattoo clients. So it should be a good time. We're getting an RV together. So. Oh well, this is exciting. This is an event. It's like you're going on tour. Yeah, yeah, it should be pretty cool. Dominatrix, that's awesome. and the tattooer. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. It's a tattoo tour. Well, that, you know, keep us informed on that. You know, and uh, yeah, definitely, we'll uh, support that and, and love to see you here. Um, I was going to say, part of your story, a lot of things you mentioned in your story, I, I resonate with. Like you, you mentioned like, um, you know, starting out in the hardcore scene. So, so I grew up in uh, in Lincoln, Nebraska like a, a, a cold place in the middle of nowhere. And, and um, I was really into, it, 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 there was a really intense punk rock scene there though in the eighties. And so I was into the punk rock and the hardcore scene, like, you know, all these bands like, you know, like, like COC, you know, tour, you know, came through there for animosity, you know, DRI came, came through there, like okay. dealing with, you know, dealing with it period. And like all these like, you know, hardcore bands, you know, Agent Orange, not freezing up a little bit there again like oh. you good about now good now okay yep. anyhow i saw all these like hardcore bands you know and i was a teenager i was an angsty teenager and and i'd read anton LaVey, and it kind of faded in and out of it but i was also kind of flirting with this i think there's a real there's sort of a postmodernist vibe and all of that um in all of that that whole scene you know what i mean um sort of a you know anarchy kind of you know our uh, nihilism right there's kind of a nihilism that that creeps through all of that and and i um you know was was struggling with that a lot and eventually i met uh, another guy a friend there uh, who was also in the scene his name was rob frericks and he was like oh i've read that satanic bible too and we started talking about it and practicing things and it acted to lead like somewhere else and it kind of eventually led both of us out of that scene into different lives and he ended up becoming a tattoo artist and opened a really awesome tattoo shop in lincoln and he's dead now this is all a long time ago this uh you know happened a long time ago but yeah a lot of the things that you mentioned in your story um i i could relate to that i can relate relate to tattoo shops and and going to lots going to hardcore shows and talking about black magic with people you know yeah man it's really cool and i, I think um it's kind of interesting though because i i think i was always like the metal head in the hardcore scene and it was cool because getting into this stuff too it, it kind of uh, allowed me to open up to uh getting more into like black metal and, and, you know, the death metal scene and that sort of stuff, which I was much more interested in, to be honest with you. But when I was younger, there was nothing but hardcore bands around. So we kind of played hardcore and I basically tried to gravitate towards any band that had like that kind of at the gates ripoff riffs. 
You know, those were always uh-huh. my favorite bands because I was into At The Gates, but, you know, couldn't afford to see At The Gates even when they came to New York City, which is like 70 miles away from me. Uh, and and now you do you play the bass? Um, I did in a band called The Nomen, actually, which was a uh, kind of 90s style hardcore band in the vein of like Dead Guy, Catharsis, uh, maybe Today's the Day, that kind of stuff. Okay. But you're not you're not doing that anymore. No, and then I had a I had a solo band um, that uh, I was playing kind of industrial black metal stuff, um, just one man band sort of stuff. Almost, I usually would describe it as kind of sounding like early Godflesh with burrs and vocals. But um, yeah, so that was a lot of fun, and I I made these big kind of productions of the few live shows I did play. Um, but I got so entrenched in tattooing, it really became like all encompassing. Which, I mean, like we yeah. were saying before we went on, I, I, I have a hard time committing to a lot of bigger projects that I want to do because tattooing just consumes so much of my time. Yeah. No, that's that's totally understandable when you're uh, when you're driven, when you're driven with something. Um, then that's what you want to just dedicate yourself to. So let me ask you about tattooing. Do you consider the act of tattooing giving it or receiving tattoos do you consider it a spiritual or initiatory uh kind of process i always say um i find tattooing to be a ritual in which we externalize our internality i think it's a kind of like sort of alchemical process you know it and i think for better or for worse you know i always joke that i've had some people come in and they're like they want a, a sleeve tattoo, but they don't know what they want. And they're like, dude, can we just do a bunch of clouds? And I mean, if that's your internality, I, I feel like that says a lot about you. You know, you, you bunch of clouds. <laughs> but, you know, your tattoos tell a story. They kind of describe what's going on internally and that sort of stuff. And, and I think that's a very powerful thing. And, you know, if we look at kind of um, from the Gnostic sort of perspective that we're kind of like thrust into these fleshly bodies against our will, and we're kind of spiritually limited by this physical incarnation. I think that like acts like, you know, I, I enjoy going to the gym and that sort of stuff and tattooing and those sorts of things. We're kind of reclaiming this like flesh prison. You know, if anything, it's like we're sitting here and drawing on the walls, trying to make this cell of ours our own, you know, mm-hmm. despite whatever. And I think it's very telling that so many religious people are so anti-tattoo because, you know, they don't want you drawing on the walls and defacing the beautiful concrete walls of the penitentiary. Right. <laughs> That's a lovely way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I, I, I agree with a lot of that. I think tattoos are a very, like, uh, very spiritual, very initiatory thing. Like, every tattoo I have, it represents a, a internal process that I went through that I wanted to externalize and, and, and memorialize in a way, you know, that it's like always like, you know, you know, it's kind of like a, it's like a, it's like a mark, you know, it's like a mark that, you know, this happened and I was, this is where I was and that I, I don't want to fully forget that, that sense of being there. And I think that by, um, because, you know, there's this idea of like muscle memory, right? You take physical, you take a physical, a strong physical impression of something and it'll like stay with you for a long time. So I think that that has something to do with it, uh, something to do with it also. If you think about it, too, I think we as modern people have so few initiatory coming of age ceremonies anymore, rituals Tattooing might be one of those last kind of things that we have, you know, like I think even the anxiety, the pain, the, the like you have to be 18 to get one, like that whole thing. Like it's a kind of coming of age ritual that I think a lot of people get to go through that I think is really special, you know, mm-hmm. and we don't have much of that left. Do I think it's as grand as going into the woods and spearing your first antelope or whatever? No, not really. But it's something, you know, it's something that we yeah. have It's a kind of coming of age ritual. You earned it. You're 18. You get to finally make that mark on yourself, whatever you want it to be. And then you're an adult, you know? Write a passage. 100%. Yeah, write a passage. So I had this interesting experience. I'll share this with you because um, because you're a tattoo artist. So um, I was getting a tattoo recently. Um, and and um, 
And it was like on my uh, forearm here, right? It's like this of like, you know, set on a sun bar there. Oh, right on. But um, while it was like going on, it's like I had never been tattooed on that part of my arm before. And, um, and so while he was doing it, I was like, I tried to, I just, I decided I was going to kind of try and do some, uh, a, um, a self-remembering sort of technique, um, uh, that I sometimes practice of like trying to come to like a phys physical sensation, right? I'm kind of trying to, uh, focus on the physical sensation of my feet on the floor, you know, and let that grow into a full, you know, physical sensation of being. And so while he's doing that, I'm doing, I close my eyes and, uh, he's doing the work. And I started to get, I started to feel myself getting lightheaded, you know, which I've had a few tattoos before. I've never gotten lightheaded before. And I started to start, started to get lightheaded from it. And, and, and I almost started like, kind of like to hyperventilate a little bit, you know, I, my breathing started getting weird. And so then I like, I said, well, I, I need, maybe I should open my eyes. So I opened my eyes and I looked right down at it and I could see right where, his where right where the needle was going onto my skin, right? And I could see the lines like coming out on it. And it was oh. like my perspective on it was like, it's like I could see every little granule detail. It's like a huge microscope or something. Like I could see every detail. And it was just like this like glowing blue line just like falling like onto my arm as it went through. And it was just, it was just a bizarre experience. And I don't have anything more to say about it. I don't have to say, well, I didn't learn some, you know, philosophical thing that's going to guide me for the rest of my life or anything. It was just that moment was so unique that I will never forget about it. And every time I look down on it, I have it. some part of me physically is still like kind of kind of aware of that. Does that make sense? Have you ever experienced anything like that? Sometimes those little sensory things that you get in altered states are just like, you know, maybe they don't make total comprehensive sense but sometimes those are the things that really stick with you you know i remember plenty of times sitting there doing like a strange new breathing ritual or something you're trying out and just puts you in a very strange headspace and you kind of sit there and experience it for a little while and you're like damn the whole world looks different you know uh -huh. and those kind of things just stick with you there's actually right. a few places on the beach near me where i'll go down there and it always just puts me right back in that headspace because yeah. i remember sitting there and playing around doing like you know exhaled like different chants and stuff with like empty breaths and whatnot and like getting into a very strange almost paranoid headspace yeah sacred space that's like uh and that's that's another like left hand path thing man is uh creating sacred space establishing sacred space you know it's like every time you do a ritual right you're like taking this one this one little you know whatever corner of your room with these one little, you know, implements and you're auto hypnotizing yourself that whenever these components are here in this right comp, the same combination, I'm going to move into this altered state of consciousness by establishing this sacred space. Yeah, it was really interesting, actually, um, kind of some open minded friends of mine. Um, I was out in California with my uh, Dom friend who I was going to be doing the RV trip with. And she's uh, an occultist as well, although she's more from the Druidic tradition. But uh, we were going to do this kind of Samhain uh, kind of impromptu ritual one night. We, we, uh, we were out in Idlewild, California, up on a mountain up there. And we were kind of looking for the right spot. We were kind of driving around for like probably an hour or so, just kind of looking for the perfect spot to kind of do uh, an offering to the, to the land spirits and whatnot. And it was kind of interesting because we're in a car full of people who are open-minded but not necessarily occultists. And uh, we kind of said, screw it. We're just going to pull over on the side of the road. We pulled over right on the side of the road. We were on the shoulder of the road. This car is coming by every once in a while. And, like, the two of us kind of spread out a circle right there on the shoulder of the road on top of the mountain. Literally, like, concrete down there. We put a bottle of whiskey in the center. And we're sitting there doing our chanting and stuff and everything else. And the other people with us are kind of like, really? Right here? And we're like, yep, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing you know, we're doing these like grunts and chants and like, you know, getting real feral with it and biting into apples and spitting them at each other and shit. And there were cars whizzing by and we're like, sacred space is fucking right here, man. <laughs> right. No, that's awesome. That's the way to do it, man. You establish it. You decide where the sacred space is, you know. 100%. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about runes then. Um, what is your what is your interest in the runes? Why Why do you think the runes are significant? 
Um, I mean, I've experimented with a lot of different magical practices and stuff like that. I think runes have become my everyday way of working. Uh, I think they work really, really great. I mean, I'll pull out tarot cards once in a while, but that's more of a thing I do for other people. I think my personal practice, I, I find the runes are great because not only do they work talismanically, you can use them in different situations. You can, you know, sometimes it's as simple as putting a Rhino rune on a piece of, uh, of, mail you're sending out to somebody you know or something like that to make sure it gets there but um i find that you could sit and meditate on these runes and they they continue over the years of working them to reveal more aspects of them and you start seeing them in your own unique ways and, and you can compare notes with somebody else and they don't always match up and i think that that's the beautiful thing about them is they're really so revelatory and have so much to do with your personal experience and your personal gnosis that I think the tarot has a tendency to be so analytic, so like, yeah, kind of book study, that sort of stuff. And that's great. Like, I, I love the tarot for other things, but, you know, there, there's little bits of knowledge that I found on certain runes that I really don't find anywhere else. And I love having like my own unique sort of way of working with a specific rune. You know, and then when you get to be with somebody else who also studies runes and you guys can compare notes, that's always like great fun, you know? Yeah. Also, no, like, I I've think it's never done group Galder. Like, there's something so powerful about like that sort of like getting in tone with other people for a common yeah. cause and using like that, that very primal sound sort of yeah. thing. And you look through every mythology, they talk about that, you know all of creation was created through vibration and sound, you know, God spoke the word into creation. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that chanting aspect, especially in a group of when everyone harmonizes, like there's nothing yeah. like that visceral. Right. No, the vocalic thing is, is huge. If you're a musician, you know about that even like more so. Um, and you know, this is another thing that, you know, Dr. Flowers talks about a lot is really into the, you know, the, the, the Galder, the Galder work, the significance of that. Um, but another thing that he's pointed out is, is, uh, you know, Zarathustra, uh, the, the first essential like prophet or magus, um, you know, he's saying the whole thing and, and, you know, that's, a, that's a big thing with like the, you know, the, um, the food, the, the Edas, right. The Edas is that they're originally, they're like saying, and so Zarathustra's Gothas are also saying, but we know that it was saying by him. We know it was him because of the structure of it and the timing of it. We know, no, it was that guy who sang this originally and his name was Zarathustra and he started all this and then everyone like sang it on after it. So it get, really gets into this. And then, and, you know, because then from that people say, oh, well, all these other things like eventually evolved out of like what this one guy sang. And that really reiterates what you're talking about, that idea that, you know, the utterance of the word, you know, God, the word. How the that like begins vibration. everything. The voice is vibration, literally like vibrating outward and then creating smaller ripples and, and influence, you know? But it all starts right. with Right, exactly. And then it starts with sound too. So there's also the idea of um of material the materiality exists on a continuum. This is something that you see in uh well Gurdjieff talked about it and it's probably in theosophy. I think it's in theosophy also, but the idea that there's there's levels of materiality to the universe, and we're in a pr pretty material place right here. But the, as you go up, the vibrations get faster, right? And 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 so you get lighter, lighter, you know, uh, aspects of materiality, which even go up into like sound. It's so material, right? It's like we we uh, wonder about are there non-material things? Well, we have sound, right? And we have our utterance of things, which is like. It travels through the air of just vibrations and there's and because of that because it is vibrations well it is material but it's such a fine level of materiality and by going through these um these ritualistic sorts of utterances can really help um can really um emphasize that fact i think 100 percent. i think even like you know reading in the norse about the literal creation of the world, you talk about this like primordial ice coming from Niflheim and this primordial fire coming from Moosebell. And you can mm -hmm. see this in the literal um, glyph of like the Thurisaz rune. You know, you have the Kenaz rune and the Izo rune meeting. Mm -hmm. And like 
then when you study scientifically, like the laws of thermodynamics, and you look at like that, literally these particles are sped up as they're heated, you know, and, and then looking at the way that sound waves happen, you're like, dude, this is wild that people were talking about this way back then. And then you're getting these things confirmed or like advocated through science and, you know, not yeah. even not even getting into the, the even weirder aspects of quantum physics and whatnot where it gets really fucking strange. But like even that like basic sort of science that you get taught in elementary school has a very weird um sort of implications when you apply them to ancient mythology and stuff. It's very interesting. I think people have a tendency to see older traditions and, and older peoples as like stupid compared to like the way that we are now, you know, even like when people talk about the fact that the ancient pagan peoples never wrote things down, they're like, Oh, what a bunch of fucking retards. They couldn't fucking write, but they saw no purpose in writing something down. I think it, you look at Christianity today, I think a lot of their problems is, is that they wrote everything down 2,000 years ago, set supposedly in stone. The Old mm -hmm. Testament, even older than that. It's not able to evolve with time. Paganism wasn't written down because the second you wrote it down, the book was completely, uh, it was out of date, you know, because it was evolving with the people. This is not like primitive shit. This is understanding that human nature is evolutionary and we're supposed to keep moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Dr. Flowers like talks about, he always talks about, um, I can't remember what book this is in. It's one of the old Icelandic, Icelandic sagas um, where the, the hero in it boasts that uh, he doesn't, that he's illiterate. He boasts that he doesn't know how to read and that makes him superior. So he could, because he can recite all of the, all of the, you know, all of the, um, you know, Galders and, and, and everything just from memory. And that used to be more common in the old world. Like back in the day, there was people that memorized like the entire Bible, you know, um, and that was like a virtuous kind of thing. And the other thing is there's this mis there's mistrust in writing things down, because when things are written down, when history is written down, it can be changed. And we should know living here today, we should know that better than anyone. We don't know anything about our history. And we, it's only when we find these primal, we find these primal things like this, like runes or unaltered, unalterable, you know, galders and stuff like that, you know, that you know it's, it can't, it, it hasn't been changed since then, um, that you get this sense of the ancient. But when you're reading things, it's like you come to a point in life and you realize everything is everything is suspect. That's like written, been written down, you know. Um, so, so that's another interesting thing, and so. Um, Flowers also talks about how the um, how like the Galders and the and, and the Gothas and stuff how like you can't change it since it's like it's sung in a certain rhythm and stuff like that you can't just switch out a word with like another word like that easily right so it's actually maintains consistency over thousands and thousands of years better than something like the Bible has which we know the Bible has just been so reinterpreted and rewritten and retranslated so many times that no one even, no one can even say for sure what the original, you know, original intent of it was. I mean, it was always telling for me when I first learned that, like, the most sort of authentic work of the quote-unquote Bible, which isn't even a canonized work, is probably the Book of Thomas. It seems to be the oldest, and it's still dated at, like, 200 years past when... Jesus supposedly lived, the rest of them being like 350, 450 years after. That's mm -hmm. insane to me. And the other ones seem to be canonized, or are canonized rather, while that earlier one isn't. But if you read the contents of that book, it makes a lot more sense as to why that one's not canonized and the other ones are. Because, you know, a lot of the stuff in that book seems a lot more uh, antithetical to what the church would want to kind of control people. Even though the... Book of Thomas, for instance, within like the Christian uh, sort of um, non-canon is arguably the most authentic of all the works, at least to my understanding, and predates all the rest of them, and they could trace back the origins of it. I think the much later works that end up being canonized, when you actually read what's in those books, it makes a lot more sense because it's a lot easier to control people with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John than I think it is with Thomas or... Mary Magdalene or uh, the book of Judas, which I found very interesting. Yeah. No, definitely. It's, it's very, very true. So I wanted to ask you, I saw a thing um, 
on on one of your videos where you're talking about sleep paralysis. Okay. What do you What are your thoughts on sleep paralysis? This is an interest of interest of mine as well. Okay. Um, when I was a kid, actually, I used to have a lot of instances of very interesting sleep paralysis and, and strange sleep instances um, very, very early on. And the interesting thing was maybe about when I was about 13, 14, they stopped completely. Mm-hmm. I didn't have a single one from about 13 to maybe 19. And then all of a sudden, it kind of morphed into I started having waking hallucinations. I believe they're called psychopompic hallucinations. Where mm-hmm. it was kind of like waking up on drugs. But uh, I would see a lot of entities, weird things would happen, that sort of stuff. And I've had only a few actual like classic sleep paralysis episodes in my adult years. But it kind of morphed into um, a lot of those sort of waking hallucinations. And they're very interesting because like, whereas in classical um, sleep paralysis, the way most people have it, you're kind of frozen and you can't um, interact. You can't, you know, you're kind of just experiencing whatever this is and you're kind of stuck. The interesting thing was, is I started having these waking hallucinations. I would wake up, I would be seeing some kind of odd thing happening and I could full blown talk about what was happening to my girlfriend who was sleeping next to me. She would wake up and she'd be like, are you having another one of those? And I'd be like, yeah, Yeah. like um, just as an example, usually the ones I would use is I used to live in a basement apartment and there was this uh, kind of small, basement window that was long rectangular up near the, the top and there was a street light outside so it would shine in on the back wall of my my room and i woke up one night and i heard a dog barking like and i didn't have a dog the neighbor upstairs had like a very small little toy dog but uh this sounded like a big like rottweiler or something like in the room so i'm looking around all confused like what the fuck a dog and i see the shadow of a dog on the wall coming through that window as if it was standing right outside the window barking at something so i look over in the corner of the room to see what it's barking at and in the corner of the room there is a floating severed crocodile head spinning like it's on a record turntable and like levitating in the middle of the air nice. so there's a shadow dog barking at this levitating crocodile head and it's just spinning and my girlfriend woke up next to me and she's like what's going on and i'm like there's a crocodile head over there <laughs> and and the ground in my room all looks like it's made of water like it's like giving little waves and stuff and after three or four minutes it would just kind of like disappear and go away but i would have experiences like this all the time like i remember waking up one time to a a group of roman soldiers basically walking through my room and looking through my sock drawers like <laughs> trying to find something i've woken up to um like uh severed cat heads rolling past my bed um <laughs> arms reaching through the wall and like just grabbing at things you know that sort of stuff and uh, i actually saw saw a woman that my uh apprentice used to work for she's a local psychic and um i went and saw her and asked her her opinions about it and she was like you know uh pat i think what's happening to you is uh she's like i think through your kind of independent occult works and whatnot working with different things you've built up kind of a lot of like offense and not a lot of defense so when you're sleeping at night basically she's like you're putting out like a lot of energy and you're attracting like psychic parasites of sorts that feed on fear energy so she's like they're putting on a show and basically trying to feed off of any fear energy they could get off of you she's like if you learn like kind of more psychic defenses you could basically stop these things from happening but Essentially, these things are going to keep getting attracted like moths to a flame. She's like, they're not necessarily dangerous, but they're like lower level parasite insects of the spirit realm, which I thought was a very interesting take on the situation because I didn't know what to make of it. Mm. So what happened? Did it did the experiences stop or did you did you get your defenses in order or (laughs) it's kind of interesting (laughs) because I um. You know, I took that for what I will. And, you know, like I've I've experimented a bunch and I haven't maybe in the last year or two had as many. Um, they used to be like, I would say, three times a week, at least at least three nights a week. Um, maybe in the past two years, I've maybe had about a half dozen and they used to be almost always terrifying, like always very bizarre, very uh, the few I've had in the past past maybe two years. I've been more comical, which has been interesting. I've never had that before. Like. I woke up maybe six six months ago, and it was kind of like just as the sun was coming up. 
and uh, there was some frost on my window, and it was a full blown hockey game with commentary playing on my window. Like, and he shoots the ball left, and he passes the puck right, he shoots and he misses, and he goal save, save. Like, it was just full blown fucking hockey game playing on my kitchen window. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, uh, classic sleep paralysis, though. I mean, I saw a lot of the classics, the Hat Man. You know, like just different shadow figures moving around. I remember actually one of my earliest experiences that I think pushed me towards my dislike for the Christian God at a very young age was um, I remember sleeping in uh, my bedroom and um, my bedroom was in a converted garage. And it used to get very cold in the winter. So I used to occasionally, my mom is like literally this four foot ten lady. And uh, she had this like Cali king size water bed. So I would go in there and sleep at the foot of her bed sometimes because it was warm in there on like my bedroom. And I'm probably about seven or eight years old. And I remember waking up in the middle of the night frozen and I saw this black figure that looked like a silhouette of my mother walking around the room. And there was a, a orb floating around the figure and then moving around the room. And it would go mm-hmm. around the coffee table and it was this sparkling like glistening orb. Uh-huh. Soon enough, the orb kind of like stopped orbiting around the figure, and the figure went by the foot of the bed and was kind of standing right over me, pitch black, and just staring down at me. And I was trying to move, and I was frozen. I'm like trying to do anything I can to wake my mom. And I remember staring at this thing, laying there for what felt like an eternity, until the sun kind of started peeking through the blinds, and it just disappeared. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And... I woke up and I told my mom about how terrified I was. And she said, oh, my God, Patrick, it was an angel. God sent you an angel. (laughs) And I remember thinking to myself, if that's a fucking angel and God (laughs) sent it to me, then fuck God and fuck his angels. Like... (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) Yeah. That's awesome. So, um, so So I'll say, like, you know... My sleep paralysis experiences since, you know, before I was like 13 or 14, right? Um, it's like when I was younger, one time I saw an orb, I saw the, I saw a black orb, right? I saw that. And then another time, um, like I was laying on my side, right? I, I was sleeping on my side and there's the door, there's like a door behind me into the bed. And I heard like footsteps like coming into the room. And at that time, my mom used to come and come down and like wake me up in the morning a lot. So I thought, oh, it's like my mom coming to wake me up. And I heard the footsteps to get to the side of the bed, and 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 then it like, and then the, the I hear them like walking kind of around the bed, and then I start to realize that it's not morning. It's still like really, it's still like in the middle of the night, right? And. I don't know who's walking around there. And suddenly I was just, I had, you know, paralysis. I couldn't like look, right? So I just like, like laid there cowering, right? And then I hear the footsteps come around to the side of the bed, like, you know, from, you know, uh, you know, I'm like this, right? I'm laying on my side like this. And on the side of the bed behind me, I feel someone sits on the bed. I literally swear to God, I felt the physical, you know, the bed like crushing down. And the gravity kind of like pulling me like towards it a little bit, like making me roll towards it a little bit. And I was so fucking freaked out and terrified, but I couldn't move. And then, and then, you know, and then it, and then I, you know, I hear it get, it gets up and I feel walk around and then it like leaves. And then same thing until it was, the sun came up and it was morning. And I'm not really sure if I've been sleeping or dreaming or what. I have no idea what the fuck happened. I asked the other people in the house. There's no way anyone in the house was coming into the room and walking around my bed. But, um, you know, one of those things that just, like, freaks you out, you know, for, for the rest of your life. And and I think, you know, the sleep paralysis theories, that, that's a pretty good theory. You know, it's a pretty good theory that part of your, you know, part of your, you know, the scientific theory, like part of your your brain you know, it's like what your your mind is awake, but the body is like still asleep or something like that. And it's like, well, that's a good that's a good theory. But it's interesting that there's always just these certain themes, right? The the, the themes of what people experience with it are like so consistent that it makes you go, huh? You know, I wonder. 
Yeah, like I saw you nodding when I mentioned the orbs, and then yeah. you've had similar, and then you're not the yeah. first person I've heard say, like, oh, do the orbs, like, yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I saw an orb orb thing, and I was, like, just laying there, like, staring up, and it's like, I just saw this thing there, you know, and it was, like, you know, kind of glistening and kind of maybe, I don't know. Now I like to say it's tentacly, but I don't know if it really was. Maybe it's just your mind, like, you know, as you go back over time, like, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, changes things, but I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I saw something like that. So who knows? I had another experience that I did a uh, a long video on my YouTube channel. You could find it's it's called uh, I encountered a demonic elemental. Uh, okay. But I was walking on the beach one night. It was actually the night of Friday the Thirteenth. I remember because we were doing Friday the Thirteenth specials at the old tattoo shop I used to work at. And I got home kind of early. And uh, my, my little cottage I live in is, like, right on the beach. So I was like, I'm going to go for a walk on the beach. And uh, the sun had just gone down, but it was a new moon, so it was completely, like, pitch black. And I remember I started walking on the beach, and uh, all of a sudden, like, I almost tripped over a couple laying on a blanket. And I was like, uh -huh. oh, sorry, you know, like, uh, sorry about that. I must have kicked sand all over them. So it was dark, and I started walking down the beach, and I had an audio book playing in my ears. Um, you know, I, was, I think I was listening to some business marketing podcast or something like that, you know, so nothing like people are always asking, like, you know, what were you listening to? Was it something spooky or something like, no, it was just like fucking nerd business talk. But, um, I saw a couple deer as I was walking down there, they were kind of like dipping in the water and whatnot. And I continue walking and I saw from like maybe a quarter mile away, what looked like a fisherman in the water. And, uh, this is like late fall ish like you know it's still like cool out but like cold enough you don't want to be in the water um and it looked like he was in the water but there was this like it looked like um some kind of light orb but i assumed it was his phone or something but it was making strange motions i'm like what the fuck is that dude doing with his phone in the water while fishing you know it's making all kinds of erratic movements and shit i didn't think nothing of it i'm like ah, he's being a weirdo whatever so I continue walking in that direction and I get closer and I notice like it looks more like um, there's a couple standing in the water with like a blanket over the two of them. And I'm getting closer. I'm like, yeah, that's kind of weird. And then as I get like within right on the shore of where this thing is, I realize it's like where it's standing in the water. It's probably about at least 10 feet deep that far out. And this thing looks like it's up to like its knees in the water. So that would mean this thing has about 10 feet of leg below it. Right. And all of a sudden, my like heart dropped. I was like, what the fuck am I looking at? This thing is double the width of like me. It's got like no head on it. It's just like shoulders straight across. And it's like got this like tattered look to it. And it's the moth man, dude, it was the moth man. <laughs> Dude, I didn't know what I... It's standing in the water, though. And, okay. and I'm like... So I'm staring at this thing. And, and at first, before I really, like, was convinced, I was... I thought it was a couple still. I was like, probably pretty cold out there. And nothing. Like, no response. And all of a sudden, <laughs> I just... I, I felt this, like, sense of, like, dread and, like, horror come over me. Like, what the fuck am I looking at? Like... <sighs> And this thing is just standing out there, and I'm just frozen, like, looking at this fucking thing. And then I, like, I, and then I was thinking to myself, like, dude, how did you not fucking notice that, like, think that that orb was fucked up? Like, you were walking to this thing for a while. Like, I should have fucking turned back, man. I should have known there was something wrong. And all of a sudden, I felt like I was in, like, grave danger. Like, you know, I was mm -hmm. like, yo, whatever this thing is, like, and I felt like I made this, like, psychic link with whatever I was looking at. And I felt this horrific feeling of, like, sorrow and, like, hatred in the pit of my stomach. And I was like, dude, whatever, like, emotional energy this thing is emitting, I want nothing to do with it. And I, I felt like I stood there for a long time, just feeling like if I piss this thing off with, like, my next movement, I feel like I'm in, like, serious trouble. So I start fucking, I finally break free and I start walking and booking it. And I'm turning back, looking over my shoulder. I feel like something's following me and I just see it in the water, standing in the same spot. It's not moving. Uh -huh. And I booked it down the, um, down the beach and I waited until I got to the next stair set that would go all the way up to like 50 foot dune. 
I got up there and it wasn't until I hit the road that I felt like something wasn't following me. Uh-huh. And I called another friend of mine that uh, that practices witchcraft and stuff and told her all about what I fucking saw. And she was like, dude, I've never felt right on that fucking area of the beach. Like, <laughs> I didn't know what that thing was. I don't know how to describe the energy I was feeling coming off that thing. But and then I started thinking to myself was. Would a normal person have even seen that thing? Was that like some kind of interdimensional thing I was just tapped into at the time? Like, was that thing attracted to me somehow? Like, you know, because I feel like normal people don't have those experiences. But, yeah, that's just something I don't have answers for. And I don't know what that thing was. But I know that there's some uh, some seriously... Like, I didn't think the thing was necessarily... Um, malicious towards me i don't think it honestly gave a shit about me but if i was going to cause any problems to that thing if i was going to be an annoyance it would crush me like a gnat was what i felt like you know and, and i think that um i've done a lot of work within like kind of the thursian tradition of uh of nordic work kind of getting into the thirst of true stuff and reading ecker too and whatnot and i think some of the energies within that sort of stuff reminds me of like how this was you're dealing with these like Energies that almost remind me of like an avalanche. Like they just like don't even fucking acknowledge your existence. They'll trample right over you and like it's just in their nature. It's got nothing to do with like there's no uh there's no maliciousness or uh violence behind it. It's just what that being is. Mm-hmm. So uh, have have you have you read the Mothman prophecies? No, I haven't. You should check that book out, uh, Richard Keel. And you know, I was—it's—it's it's funny. Your your experience sounds like something like right out of that book. Um, and I was thinking about it earlier because something else you had said, maybe it was in one of your one of your vlogs. You mentioned seeing an, an apparition in the kitchen window outside of the kitchen window. Where we, yeah, and and so that's something that. Um, for some reason, that happens. That that's one of the recurring themes in the Mothman. Because in the Mothman, it's like this guy Richard Keel was a UFO researcher, and he went to Point Pleasant, uh, you know, West Virginia, to research these different, you know, UFO sightings or this Mothman thing, and um, and he ended up interviewing like just hundreds of people, right? And it and it turns into this big like weird thing. He gets so much information, and and in the end, he has no idea what's going on, and then the Silver Bridge collapses and everything, but. He sees the common elements in these stories. Um, one of them is like uh, outside of the kitchen window. Um, one of them is like a, a, the form of a being like you described, like wide like that, like no head, right? But like, you know, maybe wings or something like that. Sometimes yeah. there's like red orbs, like eyes or something in it, you know? Sometimes it's flying. Sometimes it's just standing there like staring. Sometimes it's sitting outside the kitchen window staring in at people. Um, the other thing that Keel gets into a lot is MIBs. I think the whole thing with MIBs as a paranormal experience, right? I think that mostly comes from him in that in that book, because he found like everywhere he would go, the people would be like, oh, you know, there was there there was someone here like just before that said they were you, you know, and they looked all weird and there was something wrong about them. They're wearing black and they said they were with the the Air Force, but they didn't actually leave any credentials, you know. And he, and he started thinking for a while, he gets paranoid and he thinks they're following him around. He can't figure out if he's following them or maybe they're following him around. And he starts to get really, you know, kind of paranoid about it. But one of the theories that he advances is um, ultra terrestrials. And this is what he thinks. He thinks it's not, the, it's not extraterrestrials like from another, you know, you know, there's, that's one theory is it's beings from another planet or beings from another dimension, or maybe it's the demons and angels from the old times, or maybe it's a hallucination, maybe it's a government experiment, you know, there's all these different theories about what is behind this sort of phenomenon. And he posits the theory of ultra-terrestrials, and what, that, what he means by that is that this is a phenomenon that's connected with planet Earth and life on Earth, right? First of all, it's connected with that, and it's also connected with the perception of the perceiver because there's also a pattern for people who experience these sorts of things, right? Like okay. they either 
they either have an experience like this and then they go on and they have a new sense of meaning in life, right? And then they end up being, you know, really successful or become an entrepreneur or something like that. Or some people have a reverse effect where it just kind of, it kind of destroys them and then they just see more and more and their grasp on reality becomes like less and less tenuous. But just having that experience doesn't mean you're going to lose your grasp on reality. For some people, I mean, it, 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 it inspires them to, um, have more zest for life, you know, and to and engage in, in life more. So, so it's, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. And I think when you have experiences like this, like, you know, like what you've been sharing here, that it's, a uh, it's a special thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that, I felt honestly, like, especially the more esoteric side of, left-hand path occultism we get into goetic magic and that sort of stuff i find that a lot of it is that very sink or swim sort of approach mm -hmm. i think a lot of people end up going uh, kind of mad getting into that kind of territory but i think that again there's that potential for growth and like overcoming that i think like you said like people end up being very successful and, and getting all these things but i think you, you invite that kind of chaotic element into your life and either you're going to assimilate it or it'll destroy you. And it's really interesting yeah. to keep playing with that. I mean, honestly, it's something that I find all the time whenever I'm thinking about doing a ritual working or something like that. Cause I find sometimes there's always that wonder, well, like, will I invite something in that'll finally fucking just throw me into the loony bin, you know, <laughs> something I right. can't probably digest, you know? Right. There's a part of yourself that kind of wants that to happen, right? There's a part of yourself that really kind of wants to be really blown away, right? And then something like that happens and you're blown away. You're like, oh, fuck, you know? <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it's freaky. But, I mean, consider that, like, all, I mean, pretty much all the great, you know, Magi and prophets were people who had crazy experiences like this, right? You know, and and they, you know... They use those experiences then as a springboard to go talk about, you know, uh, the possibility of a higher reality, the possibility of, you know, evo human evolution and, and things like this. So there's definitely a possibility for taking these experiences and doing something awesome with it. And I guess, again, it comes back to uh, do they control you or do you, are you taking the experience and integrating it? And are you, you know, rising to the role of, you know you know, the master, I guess. Yeah, and it's actually interesting, man, because uh, I think, you know, my grandmother, like I said, was kind of interested in a lot of uh, occult things in her own way. My mother actually had a lot of, like, strange experiences, exactly like what I'm talking about. But the more I look into my family line, I find that a lot of people throughout uh, my family history, especially on my mother's side, have had these sorts of experiences, but I think a lot of people in my family have also had issues with, uh, you know, drugs, substances, that kind of stuff. And I think for me, they weren't able to handle it as much in a lot of cases because they sort of took that way out. And for me, especially like, you know, like I said, coming through the hardcore scene and stuff like that, I think, uh, in a lot of ways I abstained from a lot of like the drug use and all that sort of stuff that a lot of my friends even engaged in over the years. And, I find myself more and more like I used to, you know, drink occasionally and whatnot. And as I get a little older, I find myself not even engaging in that. And it's funny because I talk about some of these things and people assume that like, dude, you must have been flying on fucking some kind of psychedelic. And it's <laughs> no, uh, they're fucking totally. I worry what would happen if I really. And I've had experimentations with like, you know, psychedelic mushrooms. I did DMT one time, you know, but I find 99 percent of the time I am much more. uh closer to uh, my old straight edge friends in the um, the hardcore scene. And and I think that that keeps me grounded just enough to not go over that deep end and to be able to run a functional business, have several employees below me and use it to a creative end and use it, these experiences, these kind of like extra visual supernatural kind of leanings that uh, I'm subject to ever since I was a little kid and, and not have them fucking consume me, you know? Right. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. So now I'm thinking about hardcore again, and it's, 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 it's interesting that this experience comes out of, like, hardcore since there's, like, I mean, you, you don't think of hardcore as being, like, a, you know, 
there's not a lot of mysticism, right? There's not a lot of mysticism and magic and 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 in the hardcore scene. And I was thinking of like, uh, I think you mentioned the Crow Mags, yeah, right. So were they were they a straight edge? Are they a straight edge band? No, no. So the Crow Mags were definitely not straight edge. Um, okay. But they were uh, Harley and John, um, which Harley played bass and wrote all the music, and then John Joseph was the vocalist of kind of the classic era of the band. They both were um, big into the Iskon Temple, Hare Krishna, that sort of stuff, um, and kind of like like it was interesting. The three kind of big bands within the Hare Krishna sort of hardcore thing were like the Chromags, One Hundred Eight, and Shelter, and I think okay. those three kind of have very different reasons for why they kind of were gravitating towards Hare Krishna. The Chromax had this very like street thing where like they came from like the kind of like drug dealing violence street, very gangster sort of thing. And I think Hare Krishna kind of gave them an outlet away from that and to ascend above that. So in that band, you had these guys that were very hardened street sort of dudes that came from that very Lower East Side, 80s, New York kind of scene. Um, whereas uh, Shelter was much more of like the hippy-dippy sort of like thing people expect from Hare Krishnas. You know, Ray Capo being a little bit more of like a suburban dude from Connecticut. He was in Youth of Today and whatnot, left, and then kind of started up uh, Shelter. They have more of a pop-punk sound to them where like Chromax toured with... Uh, with Motorhead and whatnot, and kind of had a little bit more of a crossover DRI-ish kind of sound to them, uh, a little more hard. And then 108 was uh, closer to like, I don't know, Converge or like Integrity or a band like that, much darker. And they came from the place that like their kind of spirituality was helping them with their own personal issues rooted in depression and kind of mental imbalance and those sorts of things. So it was, it was dark and harsh. And that's why I think I gravitated more towards 108 and Chromax 108, especially because it was that sort of like, this is my outlet that's keeping me away from my kind of self harm and like mental prison that I'm in, you know? And, uh, I think that stuff was integral because it introduced me to spirituality in that kind of way that wasn't, flowery in the way that like uh most spiritual you know long island has like a history with wicca for instance it's a very like white light fluff bunny it's like i'm kind of a thorn in the side out here in the occult scene you know being mr satanism and dark shit and everything else but um yeah i think you know getting exposed really early on to something that was a little harder around the edges and wasn't all soft and fluffy was uh needed for me to kind of take that step to even get started yeah. Say, have you ever heard of a band out there called, uh, back in the day, called Needlehead? No. No? So there used to be a band called Needlehead um, that was from Long Island. And uh, this, was in, this was in the 90s. So like had to be like 96, 97. And um, at that time, I was in a in a in a gothic band called uh, Morphine Angel. And Needlehead was kind of they're kind of industrial, they're kind of more industrial rock kind of band. But they they lived in 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 Long Island, and we came out. We did the we did a tour, and I ended up staying in Long Island for like a week with them. And we played a show out there somewhere. I can't remember where it was. I have no idea where it was. But I spent one week in Long Island. But um, it's like. It's like really my whole point of this is like to to talk about what I what, what I can recall of like the the feeling out there. And it was pretty hard. Right. It was like a pretty hard, like uh, hard kind of environment, you know, and it's it depends. like well, they're talking know. about like, um, you know, um, or who is it? D. Snyder. Right. Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. I saw D. Snyder at the bar like last week, man, you know. <laughs> He's from right in my area. I see him around all the time, actually. It's cool. funny, kind of the bands that come out of this area, I mean, like Glassjaw was a big one right uh -huh. from this area. Um, uh -huh. Suffocation, uh, they live right down the street from here. Internal Bleeding, uh -huh. um, those dudes. Okay. Uh, uh, some of the guys from Cypher, which was like an old hardcore band right from this area. Uh, inter interestingly enough, Richie Blackmore lives like pretty close to me. Uh you know, from Deep Purple and whatnot. Wow, crazy. <laughs> yeah, pretty nuts. Um, and I think some of the dudes from Foghat live right over here, too. I wouldn't know those guys <laughs> if I bumped into them, but uh, 
Oh, uh, and uh, there was a band called Neglect, which I think was one of the most absolutely negative hardcore bands of all time. Okay. There, uh, I see their guitar player in the in the store from time to time, the uh, the grocery store. Okay. But um, like uh, Neglect used to have songs about like you know fucking wanting to pull his grandma off a of life support and shit and fucking you know just right. the most nihilistic fucking. I'm like, yeah, that would be from my area. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like the. the like I said, the hardcore scene and like kind of to an extent slam death metal is like really all that comes out of my area. I always uh-huh. felt kind of the lone black metal dude out here. Like I used to know some guys that were uh, kind of in local punk bands and they used to joke all the time. They'd be like, you want to see the the Long Island black metal scene? And they just point at me and be like, you're looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, yeah, that's a that good claim to fame. I got a lot of friends from all around the country and stuff, you know, that are that are in a similar shit than I am. But it's true. You know, pretty much everybody out here is uh, in a hardcore punk, you know, that sort of stuff. And, you know, it was interesting to see to grow up in. I mean, it was kind of the beatdown era when I was coming up. So it was a lot of just like kids trying to purposely put each other in the hospital for no reason. Right. But, you know. Yeah, it was really isn't 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 Kiss wasn't Kiss from there. Kiss was from Queens. They're from Queens. Okay, all right. So it was like forty miles east of me, or uh, west of me, rather. Right, but, right. Know, kind, of, kind of same area. And what about what about Billy Joel? Isn't Billy Joel from Long Island? He's from Jersey, I believe. Oh, he's from Jersey. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, you know, actually, um, Anthony Civarelli, uh, who's the singer of Gorilla Biscuits, he owns a tattoo shop uh, about twenty minutes from here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. So cool. I think everybody used to think of those guys as Queens dudes, but most of those guys are from out this way. Okay, well, it's a very, it's a very musical, it's a very musical area, you know. I mean, that's there's just so much, there's, there's so much. Uh, I mean, you just mentioned all these like, um, you know, musical things that are going on there, and I think a lot of people don't suspect that, you know, they don't think of that. It's not the first thing people think about when they think of Long Island, you know. Yeah, it's it's cool too, because uh, I mean, not for nothing, I think that there's a bit of the a kind of magical scene coming up too, as far as uh witchcraft and whatnot uh my friend Kristen, who actually owns a, a tattoo shop as well um about 20 minutes from here she uh very similar to me um we both run kind of like a cult shop tattoo studios and i'm actually going in two or three days i'm bringing pretty much everybody from my studio here she's going and teaching a class on um kind of uh magical herbs at a, a meditation center that my friend jared runs who um it's called the flow collective uh kind of buddhist meditation center and uh he actually owns a really good like old school 1950s style like rockabilly barber shop but he decided to open up this meditation center and like uh you know um doing cool like witchcraft classes out of there and stuff it's again like everybody thinks of new york city but especially with like you know all this corona stuff going down basically new york city is like completely done shut down so out by me it seems like there's a lot more happening i mean the housing market's like nuts out here right now because everybody's trying to get yeah. the hell out of new york city right yeah so yeah i was gonna ask about that like what is your uh what, what, what did you due to the corona and the lockdown and everything as uh, is it uh, do you have a i mean wh- what's the lockdown like in your area Are bars open is there shows going on or there's not really any shows going on but um there's definitely, uh, I feel like, people making music, putting stuff out, that sort of stuff. I think it, that's kind of the upside of seeing a lot of people getting in the studio and writing stuff. Uh-huh. Um, but, and then, like, I, you know, I know a lot of friends of mine around this area that have been practicing together and starting up new projects. So as soon as shows are able to happen, I think a lot of people got some interesting projects going on. But, I mean, bars are open until 10 p.m. right now. Um, kind of a lot of the restaurants, you still got, like, you know reduced seating and whatnot and that sort of yeah. stuff but uh 10 p.m curfew um but i mean new york city's a mess right now but out here we're a little bit more lax i mean you know everybody's still gonna wear the masks inside and all that kind of stuff but i mean as a tattoo shop we were only shut down for like all of april all of may uh-huh. which I, mean, I did some traveling during that time like uh i have some friends down in virginia they kind of have a bit of a motorcycle club. Um, I don't know if you're, you know, Paul Wagner by any chance. Uh, I don't think so. 
he's a writer. He does a lot of stuff on um. He he was kind of a founder of the Wolves of Inland and Operation Werewolf and whatnot. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know. I know so, what you're talking about. I went down south and kind of tattooed around those guys for a little bit, and you okay, know. Cool. Um, that sort of stuff, hit the road a little bit more, went over to, you know, California and a few other things. It's cool. You know, I feel like in the social media era, um, it's pretty rad where in the past, I think as a tattoo artist, you were kind of much more limited unless you were in the upper 0.001% of tattooers where you could have a name that you could basically go anywhere and get work. Now I think, you know, you can work this kind of niche, have a bit of a presence online and, and really have clients wherever you want to go. Yeah. Like, be kind of operating in this like dark witchcraft occult scene and then also black work tattooing kind of gives me this niche that I can go to someplace I've never been before. Like my first time in uh, Los Angeles tattooing, I was slammed to the gills for a whole week of tattooing. I was there. I essentially went on vacation and came home with more money than I left with. Uh-huh. Which you can say that, especially to a place you've never been before. It's because of the right. fucking, you know. Yeah. And I had some really cool clients that came in. You know, people coming in to get rune tattoos, sigils. You know, I did a a Baphomet goat half sleeve on a dude out there who ended up then coming all the way out to Long Island to get a back piece from me a couple uh-huh. months later because he loved the tattoo so much. It's really cool. You get to make all these awesome connections just by working a niche. You know. Yeah. Um, I think in the greater scheme of things, it might not even seem like, you know, having a, you know, I have like 11 K almost on, on Instagram, which, you know, I have a lot of friends that, um, have way more than that, but you know, maybe they just kind of appeal to a more general audience. And, uh, I think it really illuminates to me how much reach I have when I go on the road and you get these people coming out to get tattooed or getting excited and want to connect because like, you know, you're engaging more with a niche market and just your people, you know, the people who resonate with what you're doing. And really, you yeah. don't need this huge, huge audience if you're really only marketing to a very narrow type of person. And I feel like that's been a huge blessing for me because I get to get out there and meet a lot of people that I think are I'm, I'm coming into a situation having so much in common with these people. Right. Definitely. No, definitely. That's awesome. I mean, it's, 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 it's great that you have this opportunity to do this. And it's also great that you have the, uh, the talent and the energy and the, and the will to like go out and make it happen too. So I mean, hell dude, we're having this conversation right now because of the fucking internet, you know? It's oh, wild. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, it can be a wonderful thing. Um, it, it's definitely a wonderful thing. It's expanded all kinds of like, uh, opportunities for, for exchange and for like you said, it's like that niche type thing, you know, it's like you can find you can find the people that uh, you can find the others. Yep. Right? And, and you can and, find the people you need to find. And I want to say, I don't know if you're experiencing the same, but I, I've been finding. It's such an awesome thing that we've had that I feel like um, in such a short amount of time, people have kind of come to in a lot of ways, take this for granted. You know, I think especially like people who are younger than you and I, I mean, like. Um, I'm only 30, but I'm finding people only a few years younger than me really take the internet for granted. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I think there's a lot of movement for censorship and clamping down on a lot of the things that have built the internet and made it such an awesome thing. Mm -hmm. And that's really bumming me out a lot lately. Like I'm finding myself exploring all these like alternatives to alt tech websites because all of a sudden like free speech is not as prevalent and popular on the internet all of a sudden, which right. is insane to me, you know? Right. No, it's, it's I, I, 100%, dude. It's like, it just it boggles my mind that that's even even a, a question. I mean, it's like I woke up and one day and it's like I was in a different world, you know? Um, cause the world I grew up in, you know, freedom of speech was like number one. That's real fucking important, you know? And they taught me that in school. And they taught, and my, you know, my father taught me that, and it's fucking important, you know, and it and it has to do with the same reason why I think, you know, the freedom of the individual and the left hand path and the gift of set and why all these things are important, you know, it's all the same, it's all the same package, so it's it just really blows my mind that that's even a thing nowadays, and and um, yeah, I mean, it's like the next thing now we have to look for is other opportunities to be able to continue to utilize that internet in a way that is not, um, you know, being prohibited 
or throttled or 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 silenced you know yeah it's 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 really quite upsetting and and i think you're spot on with making the connection there i i actually listened to um the uh um the interview you did with Michael Ford uh, about a year ago when you guys touched on that very subject, talking about how in a lot of ways that this freedom of speech and this sort of uh, liberty minded sort of thing is, is part and parcel with uh, the left hand path. And I think that freedom of speech is absolutely essential to right. this entire path. And right. I think, you know, as I get older and stuff and I've actually oddly enough had people criticize me for this that i take a very hands-off approach online to all types of political issues that sort of stuff except when it comes to freedom of speech it's really the only thing that i really really give a shit about that i will fight for and i'll fucking take a stance for because yeah. like i you know whether i agree with somebody or not you know i think that there absolutely needs to be diversity of opinion and i think my generation and the generation younger than it has lost also this ability to like, again, entertain other ideas without adopting them. You know, uh -huh. like I'll have people come into my tattoo shop and be like, why do you have this book? It'd be like, cause it's a fucking book. It's an idea, you know, like right. I like reading conflicting ideas so I can sit and entertain them and see like, is this person coming from somewhere that's like true? Can I, you know, and, and how do my personal beliefs or something that I hold, match up against this so how would i rebuttal this you know without just trying to like cancel this book burn this book quite literally you know right it's, it's, and people don't recognize that that it is for what it is you know that it is book burning this is modern book burning yeah no it is and you know i i grew up in you know the the schools that i went to where we saw you know films of like you know nazis like burning books and stuff and i took a strong imprint on that well, that's the worst thing you can fucking do is burn a book you know um they're killing killing people is bad too but burning books is like that's also like very bad and you should never do that you should never burn a book um so yeah and and the conceptual equivalent of that is silencing a hundred years after they kill a bunch of people and everybody who physically remembers it is gone that information's mm -hmm. in a book right and if you could burn that book you know might yeah. as well have never happened and then history can go on repeating itself right yeah exactly and, you know, all the people that I mean, all the things that we've been talking about, all the, the you know, ideas and systems and philosophies, you know, none of that would exist if they hadn't. Th these things only appeared in environments that had freedom of speech as a primary value. Right. You know, all the shit Aleister Crowley said, you know, Madame Blavatsky, you know, Anton LaVey, all these people came out and spoke their spoke their words in a freedom of speech kind of environment. And if anything, maybe that's one of the interesting things about, you know, the story about like, you know, in the New Testament about Jesus, right? That's a story about the si silencing of freedom of speech in, in some sense. It's about authority, you know, authority silencing, you know, um, silencing a, 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 a thought uh, that is contrary to the mainstream. Yeah, You've I mean, got to have thoughts that are contrary to the mainstream. I don't know if you're aware, it's one of my like favorite paintings uh, of uh, the death of Socrates. You get to see this yeah. this painting of, uh, you know, Socrates eating the poison hemlock. And then you see over in the and then there's all these politicians around him and other people like freaking out. And it's this big drama scene all the way off to the left side of the painting. You see this other figure kind of sitting there like very sad, crying into his hands. And that's Plato. Yeah. And I actually um, was talking about it recently, you know, that. If you read The Republic, he brings up all these different characters in The Republic who are all kind of arguing from these different political, philosophical standpoints. And he really fleshes out. This is Plato, obviously, after the death of Socrates, his mentor, silenced at the authorities, just like you're talking about, right. by the authorities, by Poison Hemlock for corrupting the youth. Right. And in The Republic, he's presenting these different characters that are having a philosophical discourse, and he's fleshing out each one of their arguments in a way that like you almost can't tell which one he's advocating for. He's uh -huh. fleshing out opposing arguments and stuff and giving them all the right of way and the and the ability to speak and have their own merits and then almost allowing you to come to your own conclusion to see which one you resonate with. And the funny thing is if you read these – this is a book written thousands of years ago. You sit and you read – these perspectives, they don't sound all that different from the exact perspectives that people are arguing from right now. 
And yet we have people trying to silence one another because somebody's having a differing opinion. You could mm-hmm. see that all the way back there, people were having these same styles of archetypal opinion. So yeah. this is not something new. And you find that a lot of people want to think because, again, you know, it's funny that the people, exact people who want to burn books and censor people seem to be the same ones that aren't going back and reading these books and seeing that we've been having these discussions for a very long time as human beings. Yeah. From these same perspectives, you know? Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And that, one of those, one of the theories about um, Plato, about Plato's Republic, is that it was it, it has a lot to do with with Socrates, with the death of Socrates, and that Plato saw his his mentor right, basically destroyed by um, the state, by a, a democratic state, right, by Athenian Athenian democracy. So Plato thought democracy is like this is just a horrible idea, right? Because it leads to yeah. it leads to a mob, it leads to a mob mentality, right? And so and so he writes in the Republic, well, we can't have a we can't have a democracy. We basically have to have a a, a dictatorship, right? That's what he goes on to talk about in the Republic is effectively a, a dictatorial authoritarian sort of a sort of thing. But um, but I mean, you're absolutely right. It's like the people that are talking about like uh, uh you know, the cancel culture is really not familiar with any of this history. Um, they're familiar with this, with a different history that that they've been, like a compacted history that's just based on in- injustice over the last, I don't know, a couple hundred years, you know, of like, of like culture, right? And, and, and if, if they went back and, if they did go back and read these other things, then they probably would. But I mean, you can't tell people that they have to, have to read something either because then, you know, they won't. No, so. I, I think also <laughs> it, it it, it paints everybody with this very broad brush of just like everybody's groups of people and they're almost treated like numbers and statistics. Whereas like I look back on history and you have these monumental sort of happenings that a lot of times go back to one person with a very strong will, which, you know, mm-hmm. like you see these, like whether it be Socrates or Caesar or, you know, these great Roman emperors or, you know, fucking Nietzsche, Aleister Crowley, like you see these like monumental sort of like beings like, Mm -hmm. you know, Carl Jung, like we keep going back to like a lot of these, you know, Joan of Arc, like, you know, Jesus, like, you know, all these characters, they're like, they stand on their own and they're monumental characters within human history. And like, but they're individuals, right? you know? They, they they break the mold. They they break the bell curve. You know. Yeah. Those are the real things that shape you society. Not these like statistical like abstract ideas of groups of people that you're lumping together because right. of like some some sort of political ideology that you have. Yeah. No, you you totally fucking hit the nail on the head there with that. No, in the ancient world, the the heroes, right? They had heroes, right? And heroes are about individuality. I mean, even if it's like, you know, fucking Hercules or, or whatever, it's about, no, this individual went and did all these things. Ulysses, this individual did all these things. How did he accomplish all of that? Well, because he had values, because he was true in his heart, because he was, you know, and, and so there's all these like lessons, like every like heroic, like myth cycle has all these lessons like tied up in it that have to do with the. Uh, Values, you know, values, you know, courage um, and fortitude and, and 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 all of that stuff. And that's something that we're we're missing out on. Right. Like the whole the whole um, the philosophy, dare I call it the philosophy of 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 uh, injustice. Right. It, it doesn't have heroes in it. That whole system, that whole that whole um, history, that alternative history, their specified history. It doesn't really have heroes other than it has it has martyrs right it has people who suffered and were destroyed by the system for some reason right yeah um, I, I think a lot of people need to go back and read Nietzsche's couple chapters on Rosantamont and uh you know as opposed to you know the kind of overcoming man and uh take a good hard look in the mirror and see which one they're uh more falling into yeah <laughs> yeah that's a good idea <laughs> You know, and it, and it's funny too, man, because I, I feel like I had, um, in a lot of ways, a lot of uh, bad cards dealt to me in life, and you know, like I had a lot of like really hard things that would have crushed a lot of people. And I think you know, me reading Nietzsche at that point in my life and those sorts of writers that are kind of like left hand path adjacent really got me through those times when other people around me wanted to say like, "No, dude, you fit very well into this little statistic." 
and you can't really like break free of like the cards right. that have been dealt to you. You know, you're basically a product of your environment and there's no real way to change it. Right. No, I, I agree totally with that. I had a very, very similar experience. There's a certain point where I realized that I don't want to be, I don't want to let these people like define me, you know, you know, the counselors and, and, and teachers and everything. They want to try and define everyone. That, I mean, that's what public school is all about that. They're trying to de define what you're going to be as soon as possible so they can get you going the right way and decide if you're, you know, you're, you you don't have the aptitude for this, so we're going to push you over like this direction, and and that basically determines the whole course of the rest of your life. And it's like, you know, I just did not want to be defined by that, so I sought other things, and I resonated with influences like like Nietzsche and and uh, like you know Anton Lavey, which were uh, self empowering and which give you as an individual a pathway towards success, right? There's nothing in any of the social justice literature, literature that gives the individual a pathway towards success by their own efforts, right? It's yeah, like, no, you can't be successful because uh, the deck is stacked against you, so all you can do is go protest, you know, and you know, hope, hope the system changes. And, ho and hope for, a, for an egalitarian utopia that will never exist in this world. Right, you know? exactly. It, it's very interesting to me because if I took that hook, line, and sinker way back years ago, I wouldn't even be here right now. You know, like, like I said, when I was 16 years old and I was feeling all depressed and down, everybody in my family line drove trucks or worked in the kitchen. I wouldn't be here tattooing right now, but yeah. you know what? Like I was the first person in my family to graduate from college. I was, I, I mean, I have the nicest fucking car anybody's ever in my family's ever driven. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. somebody bought a new fucking pickup truck that was a big fucking deal. And here I am driving a five series BMW in front of my tattoo shop I own, you know, <laughs> and, and you know what I'm saying? I look out at the world and, and I see people kind of falling into this trap of believing that they're just victims. And, right. you know, it would be much easier for me to just keep my mouth shut and keep it to myself. Just make my fucking money and, and be quiet. But, you know, like. It might seem strange why I sit here and talk about these kind of left-hand path philosophies and, and things and try and pass them on to other people, but it's because I see such a hole in the world where everybody wants to fall into this default and think that there's only one path, and it's essentially to defeat, you know? And, like, I want to feel like if there's anybody out there that will even listen a little bit and to get them through, like, a hard fucking period, get them started on the way, lend somebody a fucking book that maybe gives them a different idea of how things could go and that they could cultivate self power and create something rather than just living by that victim sort of mentality, then I'm happy to do it. And I'm happy to put my head on the societal chopping block, you know, every day, you know, walking around with six, six, six tattooed on the side of my neck and a fucking binder on my face. Happy to right. do it. <laughs> you don't have Hell to follow yeah. this, man. You know, like I'm sitting here driving around the same car that your fucking doctor and your lawyer's driving. And I got right. face tattoos and shit. You don't have to play. <laughs> <by the rules. laughs> Hell yeah, man. You're living proof. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Well, all right, man. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us this evening and giving us so much uh, great food for thought. Do you have any final final words for the for the world? Not really, man. Thank you for having me so much, man. I really appreciated it. And, uh, you know, I hope I get to come visit you and uh, maybe we could do some tattoo work when I'm out there in Texas, you know. Uh, if anybody wants Definitely. to check me out, I mean, uh, you know, look me up on um, Instagram, uh, Biker Witch Tattooer. And uh, you can find my link tree there and basically find me everywhere else. I'm all over the whole fucking internet, so. Yeah, and we'll put we'll put your links in the in the show notes for this too, so people can check it out. I highly recommend everyone checking out uh, your stuff because it's it's really awesome. Thank you so much. All right, well, take care, man, and uh, keep the dark fires burning. All right, peace. Be good. <laughs>